So if that's the case, um, everyone all start today. So um, the first part of this, uh, a lot of this is um, kind of review-ish stuff. So I will, I'll try to go through it relatively quickly. Um, but I think there's lots of opportunities to clarify things or ask about things that were not clear from the reading because uh, some of the th stuff in the reading was kind of, uh, let's say, um, it, it's, it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail or with, uh, with concrete examples. So I'll, I'll try to do that a little bit at the beginning. Then at the end, I'll talk about some additional things that weren't in included. Um, so the... So um, the first thing is that in NLP, there's lots of sequential data, obviously. Um, the obvious one that you can think about is uh, stuff like words and sentences. Um, this is what most of the examples were in the, uh, in the book. But we also have things like characters and words. Um, and we have things like sentences and discourse. Um, so there's all kinds of sequential data that you can come up with. And this is actually important. Um, one important thing here is that we have characters and words, and we have words and sentences, and we have sentences in a discourse. And then we might have uh, documents over a time period uh, in uh, like news or something like that. So we actually have lots of different levels uh, at which we could be considering sequential data. Um, so there's also lots of long distance dependencies between these. Um, so agreement uh, in number and gender. So for example, he does not have very much confidence in himself, and she does not have very much confidence in herself. So there are these, uh, these dependencies where you have to look all the way from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence uh, to be able to tell. Um, one thing to note here is that CNNs are bit, would be bad at this. CNNs uh, only look at fixed spans. Um, and they don't have an idea of remembering something for an arbitrary number of time steps and then, uh, then printing it out, or, or then uh, considering that later. Another thing is uh, selectional preference, for example. So the reign has lasted as long as the life of the queen, um, while the reign has lasted as long as the life of the clouds. Um, they both kind of sound the same. Uh, so at least in American English, in my American English, I don't pronounce these uh, differently. And if you had a speech recognition system, for example, in order to recognize this properly, you would have to look all the way from the beginning of the sentence to the end uh, to get this correct. Um, I don't know exactly what Google, uh, um, what Google speech recognition is doing. Um, but one thing I've noticed is when you, I use Google speech recognition to um, write my email, for example, to people while I'm walking to work. Um, at the very beginning, it'll be pretty bad. And then at the very end, suddenly the sentence becomes beautiful and all the words get fixed. So I think what they're probably doing is they have a kind of like local uh, scoring function. And then at the very end, they run a big recurrent neural network over it to get the global consistency of the sentence. So next time, try it out on your, on your phone, um, like in Gmail or whatever mail service you use. And you might uh, notice this happening as well. Um, so these, uh, these relationships can be complicated. So like, what is the reference of it? Uh, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. So um, what, is, what is it referring to here? There we go. Um, and then what about the trophy would not fit into the brown suitcase because it was too small? Suitcase. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Does anyone know what this is? What is this? Yeah, it's the Winograd, uh, the Winograd Challenger. It's called the Winograd Schema, and there's something called the Winograd Schema Challenge, which is basically a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these problems that you try to solve. And these are the things where you need kind of long distance dependencies, you need common sense reasoning, etc. Um, okay, so recurrent neural networks are what uh, what you read about in the reading. So basically. They're tools to remember information over arbitrary time spans. And the reason why they do this is instead of a feed forward network where you look up, you transform, and you predict, in the recurrent neural network, you look up, you transform, and then you, uh, then you out output your previous feature values into your input values. So the important thing here is that you're feeding in something that your neural network has calculated on the same layer 
um, in the, into the um, next time step of the same layer. Uh, so this is in contrast to like a multi-layered uh, feed-forward neural network where you're using a calculated value, but you're not using it. Um, you're not using it in the same layer that you used last time. So that's kind of the difference between a recurrent neural network and a non-recurrent neural network. Um, so processing a sequence. Uh, in order to do this, we do unrolling in time, which was uh, also shown there. So. Um, shown in the book. So we have I, we input this, hate uh, this movie. And um, at each time step, we might do something like predict a label or something. Now, the very important thing here is after we've unrolled things in time, this is now a feed forward neural network. You can see there's no cycles in this uh, network here. So because there's no cycles in this network, now we can do all the things that we could do with a normal uh, com computation graph, where we assume that it's a directed acyclic graph. Uh, we can do things like back propagation, uh, et cetera, uh, no problem. So the, the most important intuition, I guess, about recurrent neural networks is they look like they have cycles um, when you look at them here. But in fact, uh, when you unroll them in time like this, they're just like any other uh, recurrent neural network, which is a directed acyclic. Is that uh, okay? No problem. Cool. So training RNNs, uh, if we have something like this, uh, the way it works is um, we have labels. We calculate the loss function for each of these labels. And then we sum these loss functions together. Um, and the sum uh, is our final, our total loss function. So now this is a, it's a big computation graph. It can be a variably size, for, uh, size variable size for each of our inputs, but it's still a regular computation graph in that it's a directed acyclic graph. We have a loss function at the very end. Um, so we can, uh, we can calculate things like we did uh, previously. And so, yeah, it's a well-formed uh, DAG. So if we, have, uh, if we have the total loss, then we can do back prop. And basically the gradient flows back um, from each of those loss functions that we have and updates uh, and can be used to update the parameters. Um, so parameters are tied across the time steps and derivatives are aggregated across all of the time steps. Um, and this process is called uh, backpropagation through time. So the, um, the important thing here is that this RNN kind of box this RNN box, this RNN box, this RNN box, these all have the same parameters, which means that this label here will affect the RNN parameters once when we, uh, when we back prop into it from this time step. It will affect them again, it will affect them again, it will affect them again here. This label will affect all of the previous RNNs, RNN time steps. This one will affect these ones, this one will affect those ones. So you can see that even Label four will affect, um, will you know, flow all the way back to label one, uh, passing these uh, things across arbitrary dependencies. So if we have something like uh, he is not very confident in himself, and you accidentally pre uh, predict herself at the end, you still get the gradient all the way back to him, and saying you need to remember this information. Um, so is, is this clear? I think it's uh, in the reading. Were there any questions about stuff in the reading uh, up until this point? No? OK. Yeah. So uh, and why do RNNs do have the capability to capture the long-term mm -hmm. so, I mean, uh, Are there some benchmarks which evaluate only on just these kind of tasks, like the examples you showed? Because uh -huh. in principle, they can, but so I'd say a very good task to do this um, would be something like document level language modeling or um, or something like this so you don't need you can come up specifically with tasks that would evaluate the ability to capture long distance dependencies, which is like, um, 
people have come up with artificial tasks, which are like, read in A, read in the character A, read an arbitrary number of uh, read an arbitrary number of symbols, and then if the number of symbols is even, flip A to B, and if the number of symbols is odd, keep A as is, or something like this. So you can come up with these things. Um, if you read the original paper on LSTMs, which I'm going to talk about later, they evaluate on a few of these tasks to show that they can remember long distance dependencies. But from NLP, I'd say document level language modeling is probably the best uh, task that you could evaluate on, or character based language modeling. For example. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. So applications of RNNs, ways you can use RNNs. Um, you can use them in anything you want to do in, um, in uh, neural networks for NLP. And in about 2015, I think the answer was you use them for everything. You use them for like any model you want to make, you're going to use an RNN in it. Um, Maybe 2015, 16. Now the answer is not so uh, not so clear, but um, still they can be used for lots of things. So they can represent a sentence. So there you read in the whole sentence and make a prediction, um, or you can represent context within a sentence. So you read the context up until that point and um, and make an output. Um, in the book, there's kind of a a distinction between acceptor and uh, acceptor and encoder, which I, I don't really think that's a big distinction. You know, it's kind of just like, how do you use the, uh, how do you use the vector after you generate it? But basically, um, the distinction that I'm saying here is we're taking in multiple vectors and we're either turning all of these with a recurrent neural network into a single vector or, um, or we're taking all of the vectors from the recurrent neural network and using them for something else. Um, and both of these are really common use cases for RNNs, uh, and you can, uh, you can use either of them for that. Uh, you can use them for either of those. Um, so representing sentences, yeah, we basically, um, we take the last hidden state of the RNN and make a prediction of some sort. Um, this can be used in sentence classification, um, condition generation. So this is uh, something I'll talk about later where we, we generate uh, sentences based on something. Um, also retrieval, which I'll talk about later. Um, that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, I don't mind. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, also representing, uh, representing contexts. So here we, uh, we take each of these vectors like this, and, uh, predict labels. This is for tagging. Uh, language modeling, um, calculating representations for other downstream tasks, etc. So language modeling is um, is basically like a tagging task. So if we think of it like this, we input the the end of word sentence uh, symbol or the beginning of uh, sentence symbol, um, and then given the beginning of sentence symbol, we predict the next thing, like this. Um, you can view language modeling as a tagging task where your input is the previous word and your tag is the current word. Um, so language modeling, like what we've been doing before, is like a tagging task where each tag is the next word. Um, for language modeling, um, we can only consider the previous context. For other tagging tasks where we can consider both the left and the right side because we don't need to calculate like a sentence-based probability, it's very common to run bidirectional uh, recurrent neural networks. And um, I don't know what the, uh, I don't remember the exact saying, but there was a saying by Chris Manning, uh, which is the bidirectional LSTM, uh, which is one variety of neural networks, is basically, um, the thing that you throw at every problem and it just works. So, um, if you have any sort of tagging task, your default like mode of operation, modus operandi, is to uh, run a BIOSTM over it and get tags, and then you can do pretty well, and it's a pretty hard baseline to beat. Um, so we have an example of this. Um, uh, so you can do this in, in various toolkits. This is an example from Dynet, but almost all of them are similar. Um, and what you do is you create basically an RNN, uh, either an RNN builder in Dynet or an RNN layer or an RNN, uh, 
the, there are various ways of calling it. Um, you specify the input size, the hidden size, uh, and the number of layers. Um, then in Dynet, you get the initial state, and then you can write a for loop through the sequence and, uh, and add the input for each. Um, and then you have something like a softmax uh, to make your prediction. And um, to calculate the language model loss, you, um, you basically look up word vectors for each, um, you get the word vectors for each word ID um, in the input. Um, you add the initial beginning of sentence symbol um, at the very beginning. And then you step through the language, uh, the sentence. You calculate the loss. And uh, then you add a new input. So it's just uh, basically you write a for loop and you step through the entire sentence calculating the input and every time you update the RNN state. Um, and then at the very end, uh, you sum together the, all the losses. So if you remember, I, uh, on my thing, you sum together all the losses uh, to, um, to get the final loss that you then do backprop through. So this is how you calculate the loss for a language model. Um, like all the other code examples, this is pretty brief, um, and you can go back and look at the actual code if you uh, if you'd like to look at it more closely. Um, there's also a code example uh, doing this for uh, the sentiment classification task that I've been talking about. This is not the language modeling task. Um, this is the one where you encode an entire sentence, and then based on the encoding of the entire sentence, you make a prediction at the end. So this is the second use case. Yeah. Um, in the previous, uh, mm -hmm. previous slide, with, um, when you say recognition and it's in dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, so your s dot output is it uh, is it the hidden state or the output the prediction? This, this is the the hidden state basically. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can model context every time you by uh, marking the whole sentence, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you model context? Between two sentences. How do you model context between two sentences? That's a good question. Maybe I'll get to that at the end. Um, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, I think a, a lot of people kind of already know of RNNs to some extent, so I would like to talk about a few uh, extra things at the end. And this is actually a, a tricky question about how you do that, uh, how you do that properly, so I'll get to that later. Any other questions? Um, so the, these are some examples of basic RNN, uh, RNNs. Um, so normally when you, um, like the kind of default way to calculate RNNs, um, it, I actually realized that I didn't, um, I didn't write the equation, but the, um, the default way to calculate RNNs is you have a the hidden state from the previous time step along with your input from your current time step. And you, you multiply this by a weight matrix, and then you take some sort of nonlinearity, like a, a tangent h function or something uh, like this. So this is the kind of vanilla RNN. It's also called an Elman RNN uh, after Elman, who invented it um, in around 1991, I believe. Um, but the problem with this is a vanishing gradient problem. So th this was also covered in the book. But basically, the problem is, particularly when you're only getting feedback all the way from the end of the sentence, um, this nonlinearity, the gradient will either get smaller or larger uh, every time you apply it, every time you apply this, uh, um, this transformation. Because the gradient is not, is not constant. So if the gradient gets smaller, which is kind of the normal way of, uh, of things happening if you're using something like a tan h, um, you'll start out with a large, uh, if you have a loss at the end of the sentence, you'll start out with a large loss, but you gradually step back. Um, yeah. I think it's due to the nonlinearity. Like if you have a linear uh, mm -hmm. network, if you have a long sentence, you get a matrix, a matrix exponent and can blow up. It, it, it can go. It can go both ways. But what I mean is that it's not necessarily because of the nonlinearity. Even if you don't have nonlinearity, your gradient can explode or vanish. It, the, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, let me let me clarify. So 
it, it is true that your gradient can explode or vanish if you just do lots of matrix multiplies and don't even have a nonlinearity. But because the nonlinearity we often use is 10H, uh, 10H is, uh, the gradient is always one or less, correct? And because of that, it, tend, it tends to be the case that things will get smaller uh, more often than they get larger, uh, is, is the exact uh, precise way of saying things. But either way, they will not stay the same. The gradients will not stay the same. And if you're doing the same operation over and over again, they'll tend to always get larger or tend to always get smaller. And if they continue to get larger, then you'll have exploding gradients. And if they tend to get smaller, then you'll have uh, vanishing gradients. Um, so um, in the case of vanishing gradients, the bad thing that happens is um, the bad thing that happens is basically you lose all of your learning signal towards the beginning of the sentence. So, um, so nothing gets learned for uh, the way to the beginning of the sentence. Um, exploding gradients are also a problem. Um, and this is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, but are the weights of the, at the beginning of the sentence and at the end of the sentence tied so that uh -huh. even when that drops in the beginning, it, uh, there's little gradient. But so the, that gradient will still affect the weights effectively at the end of the sentence. So that, that's a very good point. So the question was, aren't the weights tied, so shouldn't it get signal from the end of the sentence anyway? And the answer is kind of yes. But some of the weights, for example, the word embeddings of the words at the very beginning of the sentence, those will be different depending on the word that you input. So if you have, um, if you have some words at the beginning of the sentence that are actually really important, those ones will not be updated. The transition matrices of the RNN, for example, will be updated, uh, but like the word embeddings might, might not be. And also the, the RNN transition matrices might not be updated in the ideal way uh, because they're losing. Um, and if that's the case, does that imply if we if we fix the embeddings and the vanishing gradient will be less of a problem for us? If we fix the embedding, if because we, we're not trying to do anything. Um. So the 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 question was if we fix the embeddings, will vanishing gradient be less of a problem? I think you could make an argument that it would be less of a problem. Uh, but you'll also have other problems because you didn't tune your embeddings. So I, I think overall, vanishing gradient is, is a bad thing because if there's something at the very beginning of the sentence then um, and that's important, you won't be updating your weights appropriately. So um, you want to avoid it if you can. Um, just as an anecdotal thing, um, there's a famous paper on uh, on machine translation with uh, long short-term memory, which I'm going to talk about next. Uh, I think m many of the people in the class know it, sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning with, uh, with neural networks or something like that. Um, and when this paper came out, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I should try this out. And I tried it out with LSTMs, and I tried it out with RNNs. And it doesn't work at all with RNNs, and it works really well with uh, LSTMs. So uh, th this is a very real problem. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that like the eigenvalues are one, mm -hmm. but you can sort of mitigate the uh, So generally the gradients as they come, they're basically W raised mm -hmm. to some power, right? Right. And if you initialize like the eigenvalues to be one, in some sense, you kind of maintain that. Right? So so that's that's a good point. So the the comment was if you initialize this gradient here to have the eigenvalues be equal to one, then that basically will cause it, that doesn't guarantee that it won't explode, right? Or do, does it guarantee that it won't explode? So I guess it does, yeah. Yeah, because like, because your normal not change. Right, yeah. So that, that's one way to prevent, at least at initialization time, uh, it from exploding or, or, uh, or decreasing. But what did you use for your nonlinearity? Yeah. You used 10H and it still works. Okay, well, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. I've seen, Papers, uh, I've seen papers to that effect. I don't know if they were your paper or somebody else's paper, but uh, um, uh, that, that's another way to do it. But it's not the, I guess it's not the most, uh, the most common way, so. Um, yeah. Um, is this problem because of the deepness of the network? Uh, but then this issue should also be there in case of multi-layer perceptrons. So the 
Yes. So this is this is precisely because of the deepness of the network, and the deeper your network is, the more uh, the more problems you you end up having. And that's true for multi-layer perceptrons as well. It's true for convolutional networks. It's true for uh, anything. Um, there are ways to fix it, and the LSTM is is one way to fix it. Um, so anyway, the, the standard way of fixing things, um, orthogonal initialization is one uh, way that people use, but the more standard way of doing things is to make your connections additive. Um, and so the basic idea is you have additive connections between time steps, and addition does not modify the gradient, um, and so there's no vanishing, and then you have gates to control information flow. So this is a, um, this is a, figure demonstrating uh, what the inside of an LSTM cell looks like. Um, I, I don't believe there was one in the reading, was there? No? OK. Well, it might be worth going through uh, just to kind of explain. But the LSTM, instead of having one hidden state, has two, basically two hidden states. Uh, one is C. It's called the cell state. One is H, which is kind of the hidden state. Um, and C is this additive, um, is this additive component here. Um, H is more like the, the hidden state here uh, with the tan H. And the idea behind C is basically this is where, you're actually, where your actual memory lives. This is where you keep your long-term, uh, the information about all the long-term connections about things. H is kind of your short-term memory. So the long-term memory is the C, the short-term memory is the, uh, is the H. And the H controls gates that um, decide how much uh, goes into your long-term memory. So your U gate, this is your update gate. So how much do you want to update the, uh, how much do you want to update the hidden, uh, uh, or the, the cell state? Um, then I is, uh, or sorry, U is what value do you want to, try to add to the memory cell. I is how much you actually allow that to happen. So this will block you from making a modification if you set this to zero. Um, and O is how much of the cell uh, state do we reflect in the next uh, time step uh, of the short-term memory here. And it's very common in LSTMs to also add a forget gate, which allows you to forget some of the information in your cell state as well. So the, the major intuition here is every time Every time um, the current cell state is a function of the uh, of this added together with this, uh, the previous cell state, and because you're just adding the previous cell state, um, the gradients that will be flowing back from here will basically remain unchanged. Uh, according, um, it will not be decreasing or increasing because you're multiplying by weight matrices or taking a tan h or anything like that. Um, and this is kind of the key. Uh, the key idea of the LSTM. Um, are, are there any uh, questions about this, or is this clear? Yeah. I just have one question. So if yeah. you're wanting to do a tagging uh, mm -hmm. classification problem, mm -hmm. what are you actually, you know, what are you getting out of the LSTM? Because this just seems like it's flowing, the, the agencies are flowing through, are you then classifying using the agencies? Um, yeah, then you would usually use H to classify things. Um, it's also possible to use C to classify things if you want to. So. Um, one example, there's some really good examples of the things that the cell state learns. And um, one example of this is in a, a machine translation model. The cell, uh, a few of the cells in the cell state basically um, will memorize the length of the input. And then uh, after you've memorized the length of the input, it will gradually decrease it until you, uh, until you get down to zero or something like this. So, um, one thing that LSTMs can very easily learn that uh, like regular recurrent neural networks cannot learn is like adding things together, counting, uh, et cetera. Um, so I, I think this is a really strong argument for them uh, is a, a way to kind of memorize things over long periods and stuff like that. Um, yeah? So it's only the gradients at C, right? Yeah. For example, um, the way that you multiply the 
Um, yeah. So H is affected by C, by the values in C indirectly. So H, um, you can see this is a computation graph, right, where things are pointing to C in the next time step. And there's also connections between H um, be that go from H to U to the plus to C. So you see there are connections between H at the current time step and, T and C at the next time step. And because these connections are there, when you do backpropagation, you will backpropagate through these connections into H and also update the weights for that as well. Do we need the added nonlinearity just before the H Um We have nonlinearities at the gates and then one at the end. What's the intuition? So, um, the intuition for this is basically that you want HT to be between minus 1 and 1. So what, another thing about LSTMs that's good to know is that H is between minus 1 and 1. C is infinite scale, basically. So um, C, C can be positive infinity to negative infinity. Um, or actually, to be more accurate, it can be positive n to negative n, where n is the length of the sequence that you've seen so far. So the, the presence of C actually Let's it still be large, right? Um, but because you're carrying out that, you know, from the previous stage, you're like flowing that C continuously. Right. Yeah. So C C is the thing that lets you pass the gradients along uh, long over long periods. Yeah. Um. So, uh, uh, are there any other questions? No. Okay. Um. So. There's also a lot of other alternatives. Um, uh, there's lots of variants of the LSTM. This is, uh, let's see. I think there's a paper that I cited here. Um, sorry, there's a paper that I, I actually didn't cite here called LSTM, a search space odyssey, where basically they, um, they searched over all the variants of LSTMs uh, by like adding the forget gate, removing the forget gate, uh, adding the input gate, removing the input gate, changing things around. And the conclusion of the paper was um, LSTM is pretty good. And <laughs> it's, it's hard to beat. Um, one thing that they introduced there was they introduced a variant of the LSTM where they, you set the forget gate to 1 minus, uh, uh, you set the input gate equal to 1 minus the forget gate. Um, and this reduces the parameters a little bit. but. Um, uh, this is good for some things and, and less good for others. There is also gated recurrent units. Uh, gated recurrent units are kind of like an extreme simplification of the LSTM uh, that basically um, has a, a gate that says either input something. Uh, so yeah, if I, if I say gate, if this is your gate, then your next value is basically... Um, I hope I get this right. So the idea is basically you have a gate where if the gate is open, you just use the thing from the previous time step. And if the gate is closed, then you use a, an updated thing from the current time step. So um, these are kind of a very, very simple version of the LSTM that still have, if the gate is open, then you have this additive property where you pass things along on many time steps. Um, yeah, and I'll follow this basic code. Um, I won't even illustrate these because it's uh, using LSTMs in most frameworks is as simple as changing RNN into LSTM in your source code. So um, all frameworks provide LSTMs, uh, and, and you can uh, you can just use them. Um, so um, another thing that I forgot to mention is. Uh, there's also some interesting recent work. I actually thought I, I covered it in these slides uh, about neural architecture search. So neural architecture search, um, if, if you search for that, probably the paper, the paper will appear. Um, uh, you'll be able to find the paper. But basically the idea is um, the, L, the LSTM and the gated recurrent unit are all kind of different things in the same paradigm that take in a, a state the previous time and output a state the next time. And 
neural architecture search basically allows you to search for different architectures of recurrent uh, units. And they, uh, if you look at the end of that paper, you see this big uh, chart of the fancy recurrent unit that they learned that happened to be better for a lot, a lot of tasks. And I think this is something that people are, are pretty uh, interested in nowadays, how to do this well. Um, any, any questions? Okay. So, um, one thing that becomes very, very important when you actually want to use these is efficiency and memory tricks. I think this was not covered very well in the, in the book, so I'd like, to, um, I'd like to cover this. But basically, um, when you're doing, one of the most difficult things in neural networks for NLP is doing mini-batching appropriately. Um, and I talked about mini-batching in the, in the um, context of feed-forward neural networks. But in the context of RNNs, things uh, become more difficult. Um, so mini-batching makes things much faster, like I said before. Um, and the reason why things are, are difficult in RNNs is because each word depends on the previous word. So if we had a simple feed-forward network where our decisions um, were all independent, basically what we can do is we can queue up a whole bunch of training examples, like uh, the dog and dog ate. Let's say we have a, a bigram language model. Dog ate, um, ate this. Where our input is x and our output is y. Even if these are in the same sentence, they're all kind of the same shape. And we can just uh, put, um, we can just predict the next uh, word here. But if now we have a recurrent neural network where the things depend on all the previous words. Now we have the dog and the dog ate. So everything's of a different length. Um, with, and the values that we use here actually depend on the values that we're calculating here. So suddenly things become quite a bit more complicated when we want to start about thinking uh, about mini-batching and sharing uh, computation together. Um, so the way we do this in RNNs is instead of batching together multiple things in the same sentence, we batch together uh, multiple sentences and, uh, and process them at the same time. So the way this works is basically um, we, if the sentences are of different length, we do padding. Uh, we add a symbol to the very end of the sentence. Um, and then we run our recurrent neural network. And because now these are the same length, uh, we can run a, a recurrent neural network forward, uh, maybe backward over the two words at the beginning, this and this at the same time. We can do is and is at the same time. We can do an and another at the same time. We can do example and end of sentence symbol at the same time. So basically, uh, we step over the first word of the, the previous of the sentence, the second word of the sentence, third word of the sentence, et cetera. Um, based on that, we then you know, calculate our loss function. This can al also be done in batched operations. Um, and uh, so now, now we have a bunch of loss functions. This is actually not too difficult. This is kind of, uh, kind of a s standard operations. It's not that much different from what we before. The difficult thing now is that we need to think about doing um, masking. So basically the idea of masking is we zero out some operations um, in, order to, uh, in order to make sure that our computation for the, in our batched version is the same as our computation not in our batched version. So in this case, um, in the four word sentence, we would not be calculating a loss function for a sixth word um, or uh, for a fifth word. So what we do is we zero this out and, um, and now we have five loss functions for the first sentence and four non-zero loss functions for the second sentence. Um, then we can sum all of these together and, um, we, can, uh, and we can do backdrop. And, in Dynet or TensorFlow Fold, for example, this, uh, this can be done for you automatically, and you, um, you can actually just write a for loop over sentences, and it will do this. But this is a little bit slower, so it's more common to kind of do this manually on your own. Yeah? Uh, does it matter whether you add from the left or from the right? 
Um, that's a good question. And actually, there's um, in recurrent neural networks, there's two places where you need to do padding. Um, in, or there's two places where you need to do masking. Um, one place uh, where you need to do masking is the loss function. Um, so the, the loss function is relatively easy. What you need to do is you need to, um, uh, you, you just need to multiply by one or zero uh, element wise like this. The more difficult thing is um, actually in the recurrent neural network itself, if you have a forward recurrent neural network, it's no problem. You actually don't need to worry about, uh, you don't need to worry about um, masking uh, in this case. But if you have a backward recurrent neural network in this, uh, in this example, um, our actual backward recurrent neural network for the second sentence would first, um, would maybe first input an end of sentence symbol, then it would input another. But if we do it in this way, it would I input two. Uh, two end of sentence symbols at first. And this can be a problem because this results in your computation being different between your uh, batched and non-batched uh, things. Um, so as a result, basically, we start out with, um, with a hidden state equal to null. And then we have a hidden state equal to the one that results from the computation of this. Um, and then we have a hidden state that results in the, uh, in the computation like this. And this can actually affect your results significantly if you don't do this properly. Um, so the, the common way to do this is you have another mask, um, which is very similar to this gating function here, where the ma uh, this is basically your mask. Um, and if your mask is equal to if your mask is equal to zero, you use the previous state. And if your mask is equal to, um, if your mask is equal to one, you use uh, the the updated state. And the way that works is basically here. Um, for this sentence, your mask would be equal to zero. So instead of updating your state, you just use the previous state, and um, and this becomes uh, null. So this is kind of tricky. It's not, uh, it's not trivial to get this right. But once you've done it once, then you'll know how to do it forever. So um, th this is uh, something that you, you have to do. Um, OK. Any other questions? OK. Um, so another thing that people often do in implementation that is, uh, that's important for getting things to run quickly um, is to do bucketing or sorting of your examples. And the reason why you do this is because, let's say we're taking mini batches of, um, of 32 sentences or something like that. And one of our sentences in our mini batch is 60 words long, and most of the others are two or four or five words long. What this means is that we have to calculate all the way to the end of the 60 word um, uh, of the 60 word mini batch, which means we waste most of our computation for all of these sentences, which can be really inefficient. Um, so a remedy that people often use is they sort the, um, the training corpus uh, first before creating your mini batches. And if you do this, you can get um, all the long sentences together. So you'll get like 60, and then you'll get 59, and then you'll get 59, and then 58. Uh, because you sort it by length, and then you won't be wasting uh, as much computation when you do things uh, later. Uh, so this is a, a pretty common trick that people use to uh, to get computation uh, to keep computation down. Um, so an example of this is um, uh, so let's see. Another thing, um, another thing you should note uh, when you're creating mini batches uh, by the number of sentences is sometimes if you want to do documents or really long things, this is a very common problem that uh, my students come to me uh, with, which is I, I was running my program for 10 hours, and then suddenly it crashed because it ran out of memory. Um, 
And the reason why this usually happens is because you're, you're chugging along, you're doing a whole bunch of mini batches of training data, then suddenly you get the one 1,000 word sentence in your entire training corpus, right? And the one 1,000 word sentence in your entire training corpus results in a mini batch of, uh, of 32 sentences. And once you get a mini batch of 32 sentences, suddenly you have 32,000 words in your, in your mini batch, and you run out of memory on your GPU, which only has 12 gigabytes of memory. So one easy way around this is instead of creating mini batches by the number of sentences, you can create mini batches by the number of words. So if you have really long sentences in your mini batch, you uh, you reduce the number um, you reduce the number of sentences. So then you have maybe a limit of like two thousand words. So if you have one thousand word sentences, you'll only put two in your mini batch. But if you have four word sentences, you put two hundred fifty in your mini batch. For uh, if you group them based on the size of sentence, will you create a bias? Um, yes, it does create a bias in your data set, and this has also has non-trivial effects on your, uh, on your training. The one thing you should always do is you should always shuffle the order of your mini-batches, so you're not doing like all the long ones first and all the short ones last. So this is only right before you create your mini-batches. Um, still, you would have a a bias within the mini-batches, so all the sentences in the mini-batch would be the same, which results in training being a little bit less stable. Um, that is the price you would have to pay for uh, for making your training more efficient and preventing waste. So, Any other questions? No. I know this is not super, like, interesting from an NLP perspective, uh, from a language perspective, but it's actually super important to get your models to actually work, so uh, <laughs> I, thought, I thought I would uh, I'd introduce it here. Um, I have a code example for this. I think I'm going to skip this. Or... No, actually, actually, maybe I won't, I won't skip this, uh, because it might be worth seeing at least what it looks like here. Um, so, I'll, I'll only go to the relevant parts. So the relevant part is down here where you're calculating the language model loss. And the first thing you do is for every sentence, if the sentence is short, um, you append end of sentence symbols to the sentence until, uh, until you've padded it up to the appropriate length. Um, then you also create a mask where basically um, if, the, if you're beyond the length of the sentence, the mask value would be zero. Um, so this allows you to create padded word IDs um, and then masks. And then when you count up your words, you need to remember that the, um, the number of words is equal to the number of non-masked words, basically, if you want to calculate something like perplexity. Um, <clears throat> Then you, you step through the sentence. Uh, you input your first, uh, or at the very beginning, I guess, you, you input um, your initial IDs. Uh, then you step through the sentence, and you calculate uh, the loss for all of the words in the batch at the same time. Um, and if, uh, if your masked values, um, if there's any value in the mask that's not equal to 1, uh, then you apply the mask and uh, mask out your loss values. Um, so the reason why I'm just looking at the last value here is because the last, uh, the last value is for the shortest sentence. So if the shortest sentence is not masked, then none of the other ones are masked. Um, so we, we multiply this, um, and then we look up all the, all the words in the batch. And in this case, we're using a forward, uh, we're using a forward LSTM only, so we don't need to worry about uh, doing the skating in the backwards direction. Um, so you can see it's a little bit more work to do this mini batch, but it's not a huge amount, uh, uh, not a huge amount more work. And this will make your training much, much faster. You can, uh, you can run both and see that this uh, makes a huge difference, even on CPU. Um, so, um, so sometimes we'd like to capture long distance dependencies over long sequences. This is uh, related to the question before about you know documents or whatever. 
Um, so sometimes this won't uh, fit on GPU memory, for example, um, or you know, this will just result in something being too big. Uh, one trick that people uh, use to prevent this is um, to backprop over shorter segments um, and initialize with the state from the previous segment. So the way this works is you basically calculate your RNN uh, forward like this. You calculate the loss function uh, and, and do backprop on this graph. Then you save the state. Um, you save the state and you basically get rid of the memory that you used in the first pass and then you um, then you calculate the second pass like this. So by doing this, you can calculate the first pass and second pass without keeping everything in memory. Um, but you can still pass the state. The only problem is the error signal from here doesn't flow all the way back to the, to the one, uh, to the error signal here. Um, and this is called a uh, truncated backprop uh, through time. Uh, so it's pretty common to do this. Um, in the standard language modeling example on, for example, the pen tree bank, it's very common to use like the previous 30 words in the pen tree bank corpus, uh, regardless of whether they're from the same sentence or even from the same document or not. So you just take a big corpus and you randomly select 30 word segments out of it, uh, but you can pass the state from the previous, uh, the previous time you calculated the previous words. So this is a, a pretty common trick that people use. from the previous one. Um, when you have very long sequences and when you don't have enough memory. So if you have very long sequences and you have enough memory, you should just create one big computation graph and calculate over that big computation graph. If you have, um, if you have short sequences, then you won't be running out of memory quite as much anyway, unless you make a really crazy, uh, really crazy neural network. Um, so one, one other thing that's, um, that's very useful in RNNs is pre-training. Um, so RNNs have strengths and weaknesses. Our, the, one of, good thing about RNNs is they're very powerful and flexible and they work really well for a lot of tasks. Um, but one problem with them is that they require lots of data and they also really have trouble with weak error signals that only occur at the end of the sentence. So um, basically, even in LSTMs, if you have a, let's say you wanted to do document classification and you had a 500 word document and somewhere in that document is the clue of what you want to classify about the document, the LSTM has to step through every word in the document and backpropagation has to find the place that was useful. Um, and while backpropagation can do amazing things, this is one thing that it's not, you know, it, it sometimes has trouble with. And because of this, for things like document classification or sentence classification, often uh, convolutional neural networks do better than uh, LSTMs if you just train them on the same data. Yeah. Can you just connect the end straight to the beginning or some kind of thing like that? Like you just skip over the in-between things and have the error at the end directly. Um, well, you can do bidirectional LSTMs. You can do various things, but then you have problems with things in the middle, I guess. So, like, uh, or like at every eighth, eighth time step, you just put one straight to the back. Like um, well, you could do like pooling over the outputs, uh, for example. So that that would make things uh, that would make things easier. They still have trouble detecting things like engrams, uh, for example, because engrams. Um, just CNNs are a more natural way of, of calculating it. But um, so any anyway, but one way that people have used to fix this is by uh, by pre-training uh, things on a different task and transferring them to the task you're interested in. Um, this in general is is very popular. I'm going to talk about it in the multitask learning section of the the class near the end of the class. Um, but just a, a simple example of this is you do a pre-training task on big data that's easy to learn. So this is also similar to word embeddings in a way. Um, and then you have a main task, which is small data and, uh, and harder to learn. 
Um, so one very successful example that was successful in 2015 and now a lot of people are saying is still successful in 2017 um, is you basically just train a language model. You, you take a language model and you train it. This is one thing that LSTMs are pretty good at learning because you get an error signal every single time. Um, so, and you have lots of data. And then you apply this to sentence classification. In sentence classification, you have less data and you have a harder to learn objective because you only get the signal at the very end of the sentence. And basically this results in much better classifiers, uh, competitive or better than CNN-based methods. Um, and this is super simple to do. Um, recently, uh, I, so recently um, there's been a whole bunch of other papers that do this. There's one paper at iClear that basically trains a language model in the forward direction, it trains a language model in the backward direction. It has very deep, uh, a very deep language model and it takes uh, different layers of the hidden states. Um, I forget the name of this. Does anyone? Contextualize. Contextualize word representations, I guess. So um, by, by, did, by doing this, uh, they were able to get you know, extremely good uh, NER accuracy on other things. Um, there's a bunch of other things on pre-training, which I'll be talking about later. But basically, this is a tool that you should know exists and uh, think about using. Um, so th this is less why pre-training, but kind of what interesting things can pre-training learn. So this is from an, a very interesting paper on visualizing uh, the input of uh, um, visualizing the uh, the hidden states of LSTM language models. Um, and LSTM language models, this is an LSTM language model trained on either English text or on source code. And um, if you look at the visualization, you can see that some uh, some nodes basically learn your uh, approaching the end of the sentence. And as you approach the end of the sentence, you get more negative. Um, more interesting ones are ones that basically, uh, when you get an open bracket in the source code, it turns on. Uh, when you get a closed bracket, or when you get an end of line, it turns off. So you can see it's learning kind of very, uh, very salient things that could help influence things like what are the what are the characters that tend to appear within brackets in source code? Um, then of course there's a large portion of uh, of cells that don't seem to mean anything intuitive at all, uh, but uh, some of them do turn out to be intuitive things. Um, there was kind of an extreme example of this, uh, or no, you can find. Um, you can find some other examples of this. Uh, so like uh, models that if you inspect their hidden states, they learn syntax and uh, also other ones that learn semantic information. Um, I, I believe this one is particularly impressive where basically they trained a huge language model on lots of uh, movie reviews. And basically they found one neuron uh, in the model uh, that corresponded with the sentiment of the movie review. Um, so this is exactly the same idea as this, uh, this paper up here, but basically learning sentiment seems a lot more impressive than learning, you know, hey, I'm approaching the end of the sentence. So you can see that they can learn pretty uh, complex things, uh, even, uh, even with just pre-training as a language model. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, neural networks for long distance things um, at the end uh, because we have a little bit of time. But are there any questions about the stuff I've covered so far? No? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the general question was, are character level language models uh, better than word level language models? And the answer here is um, it's not clear. Um, character level language models are obviously more expressive because they can express things that you, uh, like unknown words, for example. They can output unknown words. So in practical situations, they can be, they can be very useful. 
Um, but in general, my impression is that word level language models, uh, when you have a reasonably large vocabulary and large training data, they tend to do better. Um, there's a couple reasons for this, and this directly ties into the question about whether how you model long distance dependencies. So the answer about how you lo model long distance dependencies is first, if you're using an LSTM, you might not need to. Uh, it theoretically has the capacity to model very long distance dependencies. It theoretically could learn to remember things all the way from the beginning of your sequence to the end of your sequence. That being said, LSTMs aren't, uh, you know, they can't do everything. Um, and because of that, sometimes it helps to design your model in a way that makes it easier for them to learn uh, the things that they need to learn. So some ways that people do this are basically with kind of hierarchical architectures that are on multiple scales. Um, so one way to do this is um, you have uh, you have like the p h e, and then you have dog. And you, you calculate something like a bidirectional bi LSTM over the, uh, the characters. You concatenate these into word-based representations. And, you, um, and then you use a word-based uh, language model over, over these. Um, so this. Uh, this is one method for handling long distance things if you don't want to just use a character based language model. You can also do this for document level modeling. So let's say you want to read in words of each sentence and then summarize them into, uh, into sentence vectors. Um, you can also, this is also one way to do things. And in general, um, something like this seems to work sometimes. Uh, one, thing you should be, uh, one thing you should be very cautious of is basically by choosing this model over a word-based language model, you're assuming that you can get a good word vector directly from the characters in the word. And this might be asking a lot of LSTMs because many words are non-compositional, for example. Many words, you couldn't actually guess the meaning of the word from the characters. And in this case, if you have enough training data to train a word-based uh, like word vector or something like this, that um, word-based models actually do better than um, so I guess the answer is uh, there is no clear answer on how to best do long distance things. The first way you can do it is by just training a recurrent neural network over everything and hoping that the recurrent neural network is strong enough. Another way is to kind of summarize your previous context um, uh, into a single vector and then a run a recurrent neural network over that vector. Um, in general, this seems to work better if you do it right, uh, but it's a little bit harder to do right. It's harder to uh, do many batches and stuff. Um, other examples are uh, things called uh, pyramidal uh, recurrent neural networks. And pyramidal recurrent neural networks are basically neural networks um, that gradually reduce the, uh, the time scale. So this looks a lot like the strided convolution that I talked about last time. And it's basically the recurrent version of strided convolution. And this is very effective in things like speech recognition, for example. So this is another way that you could consider doing it if you want. The only disadvantage of this is that you don't get, these are not like coherent units. These are not sentences. They're not words or whatever. So if you wanted to inspect like sentences or words, this will not necessarily get you um, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a representation for random bigrams that might be phrases or not be phrases. So uh, it, it depends on whether you think that's uh, useful. Um, anything else? Yeah. So it's it uh, reasonable to like as a particular Mm -hmm. But is it like a reasonable expectation to 
So that, that's a good that's a good question, and the answer is yes for LSTMs and GRUs, and no for regular recurrent neural networks. And the reason why um, is in LSTMs and GRUs there are a bunch of element-wise operations, and the element-wise operations basically have a single unit effect, uh, affecting the next unit directly without any sort of rotation or anything like this. Uh, recurrent neural networks always rotate things. Um, and because of that, unless you have any strong bias, uh, like if you regularize this to be closer to the identity matrix, for example, um, then maybe you could do that. But with a regular recurrent neural network, um, you cannot assume that. But for LSTMs, uh, yes, you can. And it's very, very common to see stuff like this. Um, oh, there's a... There's also something from Harvard called the LSTM Viz. I haven't tried it myself, but it's a visualization tool for LSTM hidden states or something like that. So if you uh, if you want to take a look at that, that might be interesting as well. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, it, if so, I will finish here. Uh, thank you very much.